Welcome all of you. Thank you for taking a few minutes of your time on a Friday evening to come and hear about the great things that God is doing in the mysterious land of China. I'm joined yeah. by my good friend and co-worker, our executive director at Passion Life, Mark Nicholson. Mark is in North Carolina. Yeah. I'm in uh, Georgia. This is typically how we communicate as a team uh, as we are all over the country and uh, we have more and more staff and leadership in foreign countries like China, Vietnam, India, Cuba, uh, Colombia. We meet by Zoom most of the yeah. time and long before COVID came along. So uh, That's right. thank you again for joining us and thanks, Mark, for taking a, a few minutes of your time to give us a wrap up on what's going on in China. Uh, Glad to do it. And yeah, as, as you and I have both said many times, um, to be able to do something like this, to be able to communicate with, with the folks who have been following us and praying for us and giving to us is not, um, it's not an addendum to our, our work. It's what we do. It's, it's a, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be able to kind of report back so that people feel connected to, yeah. To what's going on in the I don't field. know that that people who have been giving and praying for us will ever understand the the sense of stewardship and burden we feel to keep those people yeah. connected and to know what we did with their gifts but I think uh, uh, it's it's a burden we carry and because we just want so much yeah. of the the people who who give and pray, to get a sense and to feel the same things that we feel when we're in the field and see what we see. And there are some true uh, knee buckling moments that you just want everybody that has helped you bear witness to this to be able to see it themselves. Yeah. So that's why the texting and why we're doing this, this little video wrap up so that you feel connected to what you're doing. Um, yep. There's that's a right. quote from Winston Churchill that I uh, love. He was talking about the country of Russia, and he said it's a mystery wrapped up in a riddle inside an enigma. <laughs> and I always felt that that description was a better description for China than it was for Russia. I've been to both countries. Mm. China is such a mysterious place. It's so complex. And anybody who yep. says China is like this probably doesn't know what they're talking about because it, the at best you can say, China, in some parts of China, it's like this. And in other parts of China, it's like that. Um, but right. it also means that uh, as, a, as a missionary agency uh, promoting the cause of life in hard places, that our, the way we do things it has to also constantly adapt and change. And that was the nature exactly. of our trip uh, to China this time. So explain to people in what sense we have to change yeah. things. I mean... If you, I mean, uh, things are always changing in China and from city to city, things are changing in China. Even the national policies in China are applied, the rules and the laws and the restrictions are applied differently by local governors and, 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 and governmental leaders. So the, the change in China that we experienced this time from the last time we were in China, which is three and a half, four years ago, pre-COVID uh, is amazing. China is always changing, but we used to go and and work with the underground church and kind of move uh, around. Even working with the underground church, we were able to work sometimes with large, large gatherings. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the things that people misunderstand about working with the underground church of China. They assume that we we're working with nine or 10 people at a time, but even working with the kind of the hidden church in China before COVID, we were able to reach hundreds of people sometimes at one yeah. time and teach in multiple cities and teach, you know, in ways that were, that were going, um, but it was just kind of a, 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 a little more freedom of motion mm -hmm. than we were able to experience this last time. However, uh, the, the policy in China concerning children and concerning fertility and concerning uh, demographics is 180 degrees different from the last time that we were there. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a major, major change to see 
the new China in that regard. Yes, it's it's almost disorienting because, again, think of a whole generation, 35 years of people being trained that no one can be a good mother to more than one child. And then all of a sudden that's yeah. gone and there's the uh, advocacy from the central government to have more and more children and to welcome more children. Not that they have yeah. uh, come to these changes through the same lens, the same moral lens that, that you and I have come through them and the church has, but nonetheless, it's startling and it represents a new wave of yeah. challenges and a new wave of opportunities. And uh, uh, one of the great things that happened on our recent trip, this is my 30th trip to China, by the way, which is kind of a high water Amazing. mark. And of course, for everybody else that may not know this, Mark lived in China for 10 years. So we know mm -hmm. China pretty well um, and, and we know its diversity. Uh, but one of the encouraging takeaways from that recent trip is that in spite of some of the restrictions that are now facing the unregistered churches there, uh, in spite of the restrictions that were imposed by uh, COVID, the Pregnancy Help Ministry just plowed on. They Even, even uh, on days when no one was allowed into the hospital buildings. Uh, we had people there still meeting with mothers outside the building. And then as soon as people could go in, our team was there no matter what the dangers were. And we had a new right. pregnancy center that opened up right before COVID came. So we're talking 2019. And in the four years that that center has been open now, they report about 300 mothers and babies have been rescued from abortion. And uh, that was very encouraging. And they keep pretty good stats there and they have names. And the other pregnancy center now has been opened uh, about eight or nine years, I believe. It's a little bit bigger hospital. Yep. And they came and told us that they are now up to 1,200 mothers and babies rescued from abortion since they opened. Now, uh, that includes the years prior to covid so that's a, yeah, John, that's a I, small you know, number, but it's a start. Well, it's a small number, but if you think about it, it's a little bit different. Even from the United States model of pregnancy help where people come in not sure whether or not they want an abortion. If you think about the 1,200 babies that were saved in this one pregnancy help center, 100% of the women who came into the hospital that day came in expecting to have an abortion before they left. That's right. In other words, they were intent on having an abortion that day. They were not looking for options. And yet they encountered our teams there in the hospital and their minds were changed through those encounters. That's really an amazing thing. Now, for security reasons, we had to change where we met up with some of our, our, our folks. But when we did meet up with them, yep. they told us that what they had been doing for two weeks uh, to, the, mm. to, to our arrival there. You want to tell people what was going on? Yeah. So in a nutshell, this Pregnancy Help Center works within a government-run hospital, and they used to gather the women who had been rescued from abortion, the families who had been rescued from abortion through the ministry there. They used to bring them into the hospital once a year and have them bear testimony and they have parties and they have cake and balloons and gifts and they tell their stories and they and the the our people, the pregnancy help center people, invite the hospital administrators and the president and a lot of the doctors. And they celebrate the fact that some of these women uh, were, were able to find an alternative to abortion. And now we're just so thrilled that they had mm. a baby in their lives. And because of some of the restrictions and COVID and whatnot, our, our partners on the ground went a different direction this year. And they went to the city where that hospital is, is hosting our pregnancy help center. And what they decided to do instead of having everybody come into the hospital is they went, they took two weeks and went from home to home, one house at a time, maybe one, maybe one woman, one family or two families per day, people that had been saved from abortion, rescued from mm -hmm. abortion that year or the year before. And they went into their homes and they spent hours mm. 
speaking with them, talking with them, building relationships with them, praying with them, sharing the gospel with them, showing them that this is really a long-term commitment mm-hmm. that they have mm-hmm. with these families rather than just, hey, we, we, we had an interaction at the hospital and that's, that's it. That's right. That's right. So as much as we have loved the idea of having this big festive party at the hospital, there's not the one-on-one time to build relationships for the long term at a big party where there are 70 people. Mm. And there's also not the opportunity to share the gospel quite as clearly and concisely as, as in someone's own home and in a private situation mm. like that. So I was, I think both of us, I speak for both of us, we were really encouraged by the fact that our partners on the ground had that idea, had that in their hearts to do this. Time and spent around. two weeks doing it. <laughs> two yeah. weeks. Do, do we have pictures of any of that? We do. Uh, this is probably a good time for um, some pictures to go up. We have before our you first do that. Picture. Let me just just tell the people who have joined us. Uh, yeah. If you yeah. have a question, we're we're going to try to g- yeah. tell you what we think are the highlights. But if you have a very specific question, just put it in the chat box, and we have a team ready to make sure we get that question and we will address it. Because again, we want to make sure that you feel connected to what we're doing here. So anyway, go ahead, Mark. This team spent two weeks out just going from house to house. The first picture here, I'll have our media team go ahead and go to it, is a picture of the team that's on the ground. These are the kind of the leaders mm. in one of the hospitals, um, some of our national leaders and some of the kind of the local leaders at the, at the local the hospital level, uh, standing together, taking a picture at the hospital before they spent this two weeks going together out into people's homes. And behind them, you will notice, are all these, this is, a, a very typical Chinese way of honoring people when when they have accomplished something. When you know, we kind of give trophies in America, or we give certificates of res, re, uh, recognition. Uh-huh. In China, they they produce these banners huh. of honor, if you will, and behind them are all these these banners that people have gone somewhere and commissioned these works to be made so that they can hang them in the office. So each one of these, and I'm. I'm sure there are many more than you're seeing in the picture are, are thank yous, if you will, or certificates of acknowledgement of something incredible accomplished. So that's what you're seeing here in this picture. In the next picture, you'll see one of our local pregnancy help workers uh, who is visiting one of the couple, one of the families in their home. This is a family, obviously, that was came in for an abortion, probably specifically because they had twins and they thought that it was dangerous mm. or uh, that there was some problem with the pregnancy. Obviously, this was several, you know, two, three, four years mm. ago that they were meeting with this woman and counseling her and they were just going in to follow up. So um, I think that's a beautiful thing. In the next picture, we have another picture of twins, actually, and the, both of them are wearing mm. yellow. This is a family of four, even When the oldest child was born, the one child policy of China was just beginning to phase out. So you can you can imagine it was a a difficult choice for this couple who kept finding themselves pregnant uh, to come in and decide to keep the babies despite the, the pressure to abort. One of the things that I think is amazing about these pictures and these these twins is uh you've got well, again, you've got a a a country of people who think that it's impossible to raise more than one child. Mm. And um, now they have these these families that are just everywhere they go, they they bear testimony to the fact that God has done something amazing in their yeah. lives. That's beautiful. And and moving this story along a little bit, then we, we met with uh, this team that has been faithfully working yep. with the mothers most directly. Uh, we met them in the city of Xi'an, and uh, that's right. We actually had uh, a tea room meeting, which was kind of a cool thing. A tea room meeting in China is more of a formal business thing, and it's got an informal side to it because you sit around this table and and there's somebody behind the table and they serve up the tea. And uh, we might have a picture of that yeah. as well. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and put up a picture of that. So this is a there's a picture coming up now okay. of us sitting in the tea house, so there's, there's, uh, uh, which we did for what? Yeah, I don't know, three hours. Three I, hours I drank a lot of tea that day, yeah. I'm telling you, because every time you take a sip of tea out of this little cup, they, 
they put more tea into it. But the point... They refill it. The yeah. point is that this is where serious discussions take place. And uh, we right. were able to gather here and really talk to some of these key leaders, uh, starting off with a lot of questions. How has China's church... Uh, adapted to the new restrictions and how are they functioning and how the, what's going on in the pregnancy centers and what are hospitals thinking and 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 again so our audience understands uh, we've gone from the one child policy to uh, two children being allowed to three children being allowed but for a long time that only meant if you were married and now there's there's such a, a drop in in the fertility rate in China uh, that even unmarried uh, women are not being pressured into abortion right now. So everything is different uh, in terms of an opportunity yep. for the church in China, really for the first time, to have a cultural entry point rather than just a personal salvation or a small group church. They're now in a place where they can impact culture by volunteering and serving within the context of this medical community. And I, I think it's pretty historic if That's it right. continues to grow. It is. So, uh, yeah, I, I, J John, I don't know if people, uh, I think people would be pretty amazed to know that <clears throat> if you just think about it, to, to keep your population at the level where you're replacing your population, you're not growing or shrinking at all. You need 2.1 children per couple right. to be able to replace the population. That accounts for some degree of morbidity before these children reproduce. That's why it's not two, it's 2.1. China's birth rate right now is about 1.2, yeah, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, 1.2. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, one point. it's in a down, downward spiral and it's a- uh, Yeah, and it's lower than it's ever been. Right. This last year, right. it right. was lower than it's ever been. So it's, it's not like it's bottomed out yet that we know so of. at this meeting i got a chance uh to introduce a couple of new things to some very high medical professionals that you're looking at here number one i got to really explain how we're using these handheld ultrasounds uh around the world and uh and how we've placed them in different places uh in colombia cuba um and so on and we haven't really put much of an emphasis on using a handheld ultrasound in China because we didn't want them to be used to identify the girls and then target the girls for adoption. Correct. I mean, for abortion. For so, abortion. So right. now the climate is changing and we wanted to introduce how doctors are using this around the world. And so one of these doctors here was fascinated. And I... I think that we're going to start to be able to see uh, a lot of uh, hospitals and doctors use handheld ultrasound to save the lives of babies in China going forward. At least that's what I anticipate. We also got a chance to talk to them about embryo adoption, uh, which our audience might know is personal to me. Our daughter Megan and her husband Ben uh, have a beautiful set of twins that are now eight months old. And uh, they, they got those through embryo adoption. Well, China is very familiar. All the medical community is familiar with IVF and the fact that those embryos that are created in IVF are frozen. Um, but there's an opportunity there for them to start to practice embryo adoption in China that rescues human beings that are frozen in time at that point. Yeah. And it gives, again, the, the Christian community a chance to demonstrate their pro-life worldview by adopting those children. and and promoting adoption generally within the public. So that was pretty cool. And then we talked to them a little it bit about cool. your little tiny baby, Mark. So, yep. Yeah, so we've been, we've been, when we teach, we give out a fetal model. The reason we give out a fetal model is it helps people understand the fact that there's been so much development just here in the first 12 weeks of life, that this is not a clot of blood or a clump of cells like the, the pro choice side so often claims it's not really a person it's not really a baby it's just a a clump of of cells that is far from true and so we have been using a 12-week model and we have developed a nine-week model there's a video here of us introducing the nine-week model yeah this one is more medically accurate <laughs> And uh, it, it's 
instead of 12 weeks, this baby is nine and a half, nine, nine, nine weeks, nine weeks and a little bit. Yeah, no, we're sorry, so this is More abortions happen at this size than 12 weeks. So we love we love the model. We give them to everywhere we go, we give them to people. And we raise the money in America so we can give them away by the tens of thousands. Because we believe it's that important. So these guys were pretty fascinated by the the model that they were seeing for the first time. And you can see that one of the doctors immediately took out his cell yeah. phone and started taking intricate pictures of the That's baby right. to send them on to if you, friends and colleagues. If you uh, take that slide down, I'll, I'll show everybody one of them here. Um, yeah. we, we just ordered uh, $70,000 worth of these fetal models to be 3D printed. That's right. So if any of you watching have some uh, dollars that you've set aside for kingdom purposes and haven't figured out where to invest it, this would be one option for you. Uh, again, we're going to create uh, quite a few of these over the next couple of years and use them all over the world. Uh, so, so one of the questions... Yeah, it's really exciting. So one of the questions that just, Go ahead, that just came in to us... Uh, from a sister, Betsy. Uh, she wants to know if we're able to share the gospel with women who come to a government-owned hospital. And the answer to that... This is a great question. Yeah, the answer to that is uh, no and yes. Uh, it's sort of like when we right. as Christians in our country go into a public school to promote uh, absence education or the value of waiting till marriage. You really have to kind of give the uh, mental and physical health uh, benefits of waiting until marriage and being faithful in marriage. But what often happens is uh, uh, you have opportunities outside the school to build relationships with students. Same way in China. Sister Bai, who's been working at the hospital now for eight years, she has hundreds of people who are that she knows now uh, the reason that they go into their home is because they've kept contact with them. So I think they would operate on the same limitations in the hospital about being very careful about uh, witnessing or evangelizing in the, in the hospital itself. But there's nothing more binding, more... more the, when you're in pregnancy crisis counseling, you make friends with people in about 30 seconds because you're involved immediately in the most private matters of their life. And so by the time you're done, you're exchanging phone calls um, and a lot of the work of pregnancy crisis intervention counseling takes place outside the hospital. So that's why they've yeah. been so successful not only saving babies, but seeing many, many of the mothers or couples uh, come to know the Lord through that process. We always like to say, I tell people, it's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It's so, it's so common for people. Uh, they, they, they're building relationships with these women in the hospital and they, they spend time with them and they counsel and they say, listen, let's, uh, you've been here, you know, 45 minutes or so. You hungry? Let's go across the street and get a bowl of noodles. And they go across the street <laughs> and get a bowl of noodles. And that's, that's where the gospel comes that's out. That's right. That's right. I have always liked to say that the Pregnancy Help Movement is the most evangelistic movement in the world today. My own personal experience is that uh, when you help a mother save her baby in the providence of God, the baby saves the mother. Uh, that, I've seen that again and again and again and again, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, again, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to send them to yep. us via the chat box, and we'll, we'll jump right on them. So, um, yeah, we'd love to answer after questions. meeting with these people and introducing the fetal models as an educational tool. We're looking to ma manufacture these in China now. We're just looking into the cost relative to that. But again, if we start to work in more hospitals in China, which now the door seems to be opening, and we want to educate more people in, the, in those towns to become volunteers at these counseling offices in the hospitals, we need to educate them. We need to get to these leaders, community leaders, educate them about God's will and the value of human life 
and we'll be handing out right. uh, tens of thousands of these in the coming years, not just in China, but in other parts of the world. But we're gearing up for this. So that that we call this the tiny baby or our littlest missionary, because everybody who receives one of these wants to show it to somebody else. So he becomes the testimony right. of the gospel of life. Mark, I want to move on to the other part of our yeah. trip. Uh, we went to yep. Hangzhou. And uh, yep, that's another major city. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about uh, what happened there, and I think you might have a picture too about that as well. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and throw up the first picture from Hangzhou? Uh, what was really unique about Hangzhou is we were able to meet with leaders who have incredible influence at the central government level in mm. China. So these are leaders who work with uh, Zhejiang University, which is a research university. It's, it's, if you will, it's the, it's the, it's the Yale of China. It's one of the top universities mm. in all of China. They do all kinds of research. And these researchers are researching how to help the government figure out ways to have more babies. Mm. That's, that's shorthand for what it is they're doing. They're, in, they're protecting the fertility of China. That's their desire. So here we are at another tea meeting. John is explaining um, to some of these high level leaders uh, what it is that we have been able to do in China that will help them as they advise the central government on how to increase fertility and, and, to, and to strengthen the, the ability of, of Chinese people to have babies in China, mm. uh, what, what we can do to assist them in that, if you will. That's right. It's interesting, too, language is such a part of, of every uh, debate. Uh, and in China now, some of these people have adopted some language that I had never heard of before. But instead of talking about uh, anti-abortion or pro-life, these are all loaded terms in many parts of the world. They're not talking about fertility protection, uh, because obviously one of the consequences of abortion is infertility. And so many women in, in China now uh, are struggling with infertility. So the whole idea yep. of helping people have babies, uh, uh, some of these researchers are referring to this process as fertility protection. <laughs> so that's language yep. I would welcome uh, and be glad to use. So to, to protect the health, yes. I would just say to protect the health and the well-being of women uh, and mothers, yeah. we would want to help them have their babies rather than abort them. Uh, but however they want to describe on. it, yeah, that's many what women these right leaders after are their abortion and they're looking to us to explain what is a pregnancy help clinic, how does it run, yeah. how is it set up, why is it so effective, and that picture that you were looking at was me explaining again how over 3,000 pregnancy help ministries have been started in the U.S., probably another 3,000 around the world outside the U.S. And only now is this model coming to China. And this university has, what, six or seven research hospitals. So I think exactly that we're right. going to be able to yeah, they have form a, a, a partnership with them to expand pregnancy help uh, crisis intervention into more hospitals in this part of China. Let me say that the the, the group in Zhejiang University uh, have seven hospitals that they're producing pilot programs for how to increase or, or enhance or protect fertility in China. And uh, what they're doing is they're, they're advising the central government, if we wanna have more babies, here are the kinds of things that we need to do to protect fertility within the the population in China. So they are turning to us at this That's point right. to help them enhance fertility protection, if you yeah. will. They're saying, you guys have a model out in this other part of the country that is working within government hospitals. And we would like to pilot that model in these seven uh, hospitals that we have and see if we can actually increase, if we can enhance or protect fertility through your model in these areas. So this is a way that essentially the people who advise the government are coming to us yeah. to say, can you help us? Yeah, it's quite a change. Yeah. It's quite a change. And I would say, again, if there's one uh, 
one prayer request that I think would be important for our community of support to to join us in, it's the prayer for wisdom and discernment and forming relationships with people in a secular context uh, yeah. um, and be able to be a bridge between the Christian community that we're so familiar with and committed to and seeing, uh, yeah. like in our own country, when Christians are in positions of influence, uh, they're able not only to share their own testimony, but to influence policy and health policy and eventually law uh, that affects many, many people yeah. beyond them. So, um, listen, our time is short. Uh, I just want to, I got one more question I wanted to answer, Mark, before yeah. you wrap things up. But we got a question. It's a great question. Uh, the yeah. question that we got was, uh, how how well do these people that we're now meeting and talking about working with, they advise the government, understand yep. the Christian nature of our work? And the answer to that yep. question is uh, that we tried to be transparent and honest. Uh, we're not trying to hide anything. And actually, what we're trying to do is That's show right. them that if they want to increase births in China, probably the one group that are their best friends to accomplish that goal is the Christian community because they have a worldview exactly right. that is open to the authority of Scripture and the commendation of family as treasure. So we are trying to make the case in a secular culture for why we are Christians, proud to be Christians, and the fact that our Christianity serves this cause of fertility protection and the well-being of mothers and babies. Yes, yeah, so John, this question came in from Willie, and it, it's, a, it's a great question. And Willie, I would say that, that John had the great insight to be able to say during those meetings, don't be afraid of the fact that Christians are gonna take the lead on this particular issue. In other words, Yes, you're a communist government. You 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 don't want there to be a lot of propagation of Christian uh, uh, witness in the country, but recognize that it was Christians who invented hospitals in the first place, because Christians wanted to help people in their communities, wanted to be able to to make an entry point into uh, uh, places of need within their communities, and over time. All of the hospitals in China that were started by missionaries and Christians, many of them became, you know, were, were taken over by local government. And the Christians were happy to see it happen because the local people are being served in their time of need, in their place of need. Point being, oftentimes when you start a ministry of, uh, of trying to change the culture, trying to change people's minds about abortion, the Christians will be at the forefront. That does not have to be intimidating to the Chinese communist government, the Christians will be the ones to start. Eventually, it will be seen as a way of serving the community legitimately, whether it's tied to religion or not. So we have generally taken the posture right now of trying to be a little bit more above board That's right. with our Christian witness than trying to hide it as we may have in the past in order to, to keep from being kicked out That's of the country. Right. That's right. Uh, before we wrap up, we also got a question from Kent about whether or not the government's kind of recognized the mistake of the one-child policy. And that is definitely a political question. And I can tell you, yep. Mark, you can confirm it probably. But these are not things, whether it's in Ch China or the U.S., I don't see leaders very often admitting they were wrong about anything. They just create a new policy yeah. that may be 180 <laughs> degrees out of phase of what the old one was, and they just keep going. So we set all that stuff aside as politics, and we try to stay yeah. on mission. God yeah. sent us to China and other hard places to expand the gospel of life and to equip the church in China particularly to stand up and defend life and impact the culture. And victory for us would be whether Christians, non-Christians, Muslims, people of faith or no faith, all value human life um, and, exactly. and agree with us. That would be maybe a 100-year mission, but that's where we're headed. Yeah. So thanks, Mark, uh, for your time. I know you've got to get to dinner. And um, 
Yeah, I've got a dinner reservation. So thank you all for joining uh, us for this uh, 30, 40 minutes and for praying for us while we were in China. My next trip will be off to Romania this fall. So uh, we have a team in Cuba leaving in another two weeks. So we, we've got a lot of things going on and we would welcome every single prayer of intercession that you can bring to the Lord on our behalf. Uh, we thank you for it. Super. So thank you all and uh, God's yeah, blessing. Just as a, as a, as a wrap up, um, just before we go, thank you for attending this. There are so many of you guys who've been sending in questions and have been watching this. Do not forget as an action point that John and I are, pre are, are preparing and, and putting out weekly podcasts, if you will, on social media and there you can find them at the Passion Life website. Mm. Do follow those things because we're, we're, we're trying to address relevant questions. We're trying to uh, uh, address questions within missions, question with, questions within the pro-life world. And sometimes it's just questions from the United States culture. Sometimes it's John and I are sharing things that we, insights that we're learning in our Bible study or as we're preparing for a Sunday school class and um, just trying to kind of build a, a community of, of listening to what the Word of God has to say and honoring it and obeying it, which is the foundation for all that Passion Life does. So yeah. please do kind of follow us in these weekly podcasts. Yep. yep. And spread the word because we need to bro grow this community if we're going to continue to grow the effort in hard places. That's right. All right. May the Lord bless you and uh, thank you again.